Hello, everybody. So I'm now uh, back in my uh, home office. I was uh, earlier today uh, in the field launching a balloon together with my children. Um, as uh, most of you, I guess, um, we at Lacuna are working from uh, from home. And we were actually already quite prepared for that because we are a very uh, distributed company with people everywhere. So we basically continue to work as we, as we did before. Um, for myself, I have uh, all the equipment I need here. Uh, I even have an, a satellite payload, so I have a receiver and we just keep doing uh, and progressing the way we did. Obviously, we're also dependent on external people who, uh, for example, for the launches and uh, there, there might be an impact uh, due to the current uh, situation. But so far, we, uh, we keep making uh, progress. Earlier today, we were supposed to have a talk uh, in the morning session, but uh, due to some technical problems, we uh, decided to skip that because we had this slot uh, as well. Um, so I will use a few of the slides uh, that we had in this um, uh, earlier, uh, for this earlier session uh, today. Um, and then uh, I have some things for the, for the workshop. So the things I will be covering today is a quick overview of exactly what we do and how it works, um, some of the things we have already done and, and, and tested, and then I want to focus a bit on what it actually takes to get your device onto Lacuna. And uh, I know we're not ready to, uh, to open the service yet, but at least we can explain you what it takes to get your device ready and also such that you can prepare it and understand what would be needed in the future. Um, at the end, after the uh, workshop, um, we have two uh, movies that will be played, uh, made by my colleagues, uh, one from Maria Kalama, that shows uh, a behind the scenes of uh, building the satellite hardware, which is uh, really interesting to see. And there's a one, one from uh, Dario, who will uh, uh, show you a little bit of our office, uh, where Joost is making the prototypes for the device hardware. So let me get started. I have a few small video here that actually I think explains best what we do. Um, I hope my uh, screen is shared by now. Um, so I will just start it and assume uh, you will see it. So here you see one of our satellites uh, orbiting the globe, um, taking uh, roughly 100 minutes, a little bit less, 95. Uh, for one orbit and basically it's scanning the whole globe because once it has uh, made an orbit uh, the earth has moved under it and it's scanning a new part of the globe it's a diameter on the ground a bit more than 500 kilometer actually whenever the satellite moves over a device um, the device can send to it the satellite will receive it will buffer it and send it down to a ground station from the ground station we receive the data and we distribute it to wherever the data needs to go because this is all uh, LoRaWAN. We know from the device addresses and, and other data to where to send this. Um, I will show the video again. It went a little bit fast. So here again, you see the Earth rotating. The satellite is orbiting the globe and you see how it basically covers the whole globe in a day. The beam width you see here is a little smaller. This is more like an artistic uh, impression than uh, a real simulation. So whenever the satellite is over your head, the device will send. I will talk later on how the device actually knows what is the right time to send. Um, then the device passes one of the ground stations, uh, especially around the North Pole and the South Pole, because the satellite is seen often there. And from there, we send it to all the places where it needs to go. And that's one of the things I'm going to show later on uh, in, real, uh, in, a, in a real demo. OK, let's stop the video and move to a few of the slides that we were actually going to present um, this morning. Um, so you have already seen the video. Let me put this full screen. So on social media, you probably have seen a few uh, updates from us already and from people around the world who are uh, helping us in, in uh, testing. Um, so we have one satellite in orbit now uh, to demonstrate and to, uh, to uh, improve the service. And uh, it's working, uh, to be honest, beyond my own expectations uh, from all kinds of places in the world, but very simple hardware uh, we can send to the satellite. Um, even if we give the hardware to other people, uh, they can reproduce what, what we have done, which is the best sign that this actually works and is simple to do. 
So here's a very nice example. Um, uh, somebody, a researcher going to Antarctica who took one of our devices and uh, put it on the boat there. And uh, we could actually uh, receive messages and see where it was uh, all the way from, uh, from Antarctica. This is from uh, Scott Waller uh, from uh, his company called Thingy in the US, who is uh, uh, looking, uh, is building a wild wildfire detector, uh, obviously in places where normally there is no LoRaWAN coverage. Um, he has been testing our device connected to his own sensor and uh, within a day or so had this up and running. A uh, very nice use case and a good example of where and what we can do. This one from uh, my uh, uh, name fellow, Thomas, uh, uh, from SenseEdge uh, was presented earlier today, so I'm not going to talk much about it, but uh, it's also related to the fires in, in Australia and uh, drinking uh, water for, uh, for animals. This, is, this was a very interesting project uh, we worked on together with a company called Plant E. They do power harvesting from, from plants. Um, so the bacteria inside the, 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 the earth uh, in the ground um, produce a very small uh, potential that, they can, that we can harvest. And um, we can actually show that we can buffer this, uh, this uh, potential and that we can send messages to a satellite. So this was a true plant power device sending to a satellite. Uh, so the plant is monitored by the device. We monitor the power harvesting itself, the temperature, the humidity, everything, and we send this uh, to the satellite. And it's a perfect uh, illustration of how extremely power efficient uh, uh, sending LoRaWAN messages is to a satellite. Obviously, it's as power efficient as sending a LoRaWAN message to a terrestrial gateway, uh, but the difference is uh, the satellite gateway is further away, and uh, there are no other satellite solutions that work at such low power levels. So today's uh, workshop is a bit more about uh, the hands-on side. So what does it take to, uh, uh, to build your uh, device? Um, so I'm going to cover this in two parts later on, um, which, one, which uh, one side is what do you need to change in the hardware? And the other side is what kind of software changes do we have? Um, actually, this might be maybe the better moment to just uh, dive into that. So, as said before, um, our service allows you to send from a normal LoRaWAN device to a satellite. So, the hardware you build can work on a terrestrial network and it can work to satellite. So, you can build devices that do both, or you can design a device that does either one. But because it's the same hardware, it's an enormous uh, cost saving in developing it, and also your whole certification applies to to both sides. So the question is, what is different for sending to a satellite? Because a normal LoRaWAN device, as you have it right now, will not reach the satellite. The most important thing is the antenna. You already see it in the picture here, and I have one here uh, with me as well. So I put it in front of the camera. Um, you need a, a so-called right-hand circular polarized antenna. Um, and the most important feature of this antenna is that it actually sends the energy uh, of the radio towards the satellite, um, also with a slightly different polarization. Um, this is really important. The satellite is far away. On the ground, you can get away with either an antenna that, that works very poorly or, 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 or works hardly at all, and you can still reach uh, your, your gateways. Um, to the satellite, it really needs to be a good antenna. We have multiple sources of those. Here's another one. This one is built by ArefThings. It's also the one you see uh, in the slide. Um, so this type of antenna needs to be uh, on your device. So if you design a device, make sure you have a connector for the antenna such that you can actually have an antenna for terrestrial and an antenna for, uh, for the satellite. Obviously, the same antenna, if I show it like this, it also radiates, radiates very well in the horizontal plane. So if you put this antenna on your device, it's perfectly received by the terrestrial gateways. And we use already we already use this for a lot of use cases where we have devices that talk to both to uh, TTN gateways or, or TTI gateways and to the satellite. So these two antennas uh, are, are relatively uh, uh, similar. There's one other option that we have that we have tested, which is this one. Um, which is a patch antenna built by Tower Glass as an 868 patch antenna. You need a small ground plane. This works very well as well, but it is very hard to tune. So putting this in a case takes a lot of tuning and retuning to, to get it right, and it has a very small bandwidth. 
So it works, but it's much more sensitive to the whole environment. These antennas are a little bit more robust. Here we have separate antennas. Um, <clears throat> one of the devices that uh, RF things, uh, Fabian Ferrero, who was also giving a workshop uh, today, is uh, making for us is this device, and I hope I'm showing it right, I can't see my own camera, um, where the antenna and the electronics PCB is now integrated. So the bottom PCB is both for the electronics as well as the ground plane for the antenna, and it saves you a lot of space, so you only need one extra layer. We have tested this, and it works really well. Um, uh, RF Things is going to sell these things, and uh, the plan is that they will be available in the summer. So that was on the hardware side. Um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, uh, to use our service, you need one of the newer line uh, Semtech chips, so the SX1262, uh, or the, the very new one, the, the LR1110. Uh, this is because the modulation we use to the satellite is not the standard uh, uh, LoRa as we use it for terrestrial, so it's not SF7 to SF12, it's something uh, new and different. Uh, officially called LoRa E, um, but this will be for the user just like a data rate in the LoRaWAN uh, channel plan. So in LoRaWAN you have uh, channels which have SF7 to SF12, you have an FSK channel, you have a high bandwidth channel, so 250 kilohertz uh, LoRa, and just in addition to that there will be another data rate which will be officially de defined, and that data rate will allow you to talk to the satellite, but also to gateways on the ground that support the same protocol. There's no difference uh, in that data rate whether you talk to a satellite or to uh, a terrestrial gateway. So that feature is supported in the newer chips. Uh, so make sure for new designs you use the 1260 to 1261 also works. Um, there are plenty of modules available. Uh, what is also very interesting is the ST uh, SOC that has been uh, released and I was a talk about that earlier today. Uh, Murata has uh, released a very nice new module. Those are just perfect matches for the for the Laguna satellite service. Then we come to the device side, the the, the software side. I will show a little bit more about that uh, uh, live later on. Um, but here we will actually provide you a few options. Um, we have an, a library developed. Uh, actually, my colleague uh, Jeroen Koops developed that called Lip Laguna, which is a very basic transmit only. Uh, library, um, that uh, Arduino compatible library that helps you getting started. So it allows you to send messages to the satellite or to a terrestrial gateway and even receive a single message. But it's by far not a lower WAN stack and it, uh, it will never be uh, developed in that way. In the meantime, we're uh, working on uh, with Basic Mac and uh, Matthijs Koyman is working with us to uh, uh, port uh, Basic Mac to uh, Arduino. And we will add this new uh, uh, data rate to it and make it public. I will show in, um, in GitHub in a few moments uh, the details of that. Later on, we will make sure that everything you need for the satellite is fully covered in soft modem, which is another very nice solution. So anything you need will be available in open source. And that's also why on this slide it says, if you can't take it apart, uh, well, then basically you don't own it. And that's a big difference and a fundamental difference from what we do versus basically any other satellite or satellite IoT company is that we allow you with your device directly to send to the satellite. Any other solution sells you a modem. It's a black box, you don't know how it works, you get a manual with it and you need to integrate it. Here you can have the same device that you use for your use cases on the ground sending to a satellite. Okay, let me move on. These were the development kits that will be uh, available uh, in the summer if, if nothing uh, gets delayed. Um, that's basically this device. Um, it's a very standard uh, LoRa, LoRa One device. There's nothing fancy about it. It's just to help you getting started. Um, you can either use this or build something yourself. It's all perfectly fine. This morning, uh, I, I bet a, a lot of you have been uh, watching uh, Nicolas Ronès talk about uh, LoRa Edge. Um, we have been uh, working on it and testing with it, and it's a perfect match for what we do. So here you see actually a newer version of our board where the LR1110 has been integrated. 
And this chip allows you to do GNSS scanning, Wi-Fi localization, and send to the satellite all in one chip, which is just a brilliant combination for us. So we can use it to see if we're indoor or outdoor. So if we're indoor, you know you don't you can't send to the satellite, for example. Um, as Nicola explained, you sleep for a whole day, you wake up, within a few seconds you have the data, you can send it to the satellite, and you go can go back into sleep again. So we can make this truly low power in the combination of low power sending to a satellite and low power localization based on GPS. We have been testing with this. Uh, it works perfectly fine uh, also to the satellite. And uh, to test uh, the real life performance, I actually put this on one of my children's bikes. Um, I let them ride around with it on their bike and I gave them five minutes head start and then tried to find them. And I can assure you every time it worked and I could actually find them and trace them back. So two or a few more very quick use cases. This uh, from Irnas. Uh, Luca has already, uh, I think, talked about it. Or there's tomorrow a talk specifically about the elephant tracker, uh, another good uh, use case for the satellite. We work very closely with Miromiko on building sensors that work on our system, uh, as well as with Parametric, who help also helps us in building the electronics for the, for the satellite itself. OK, last one on the slide. This is a boat we are following on the ocean. Um, at the Things Conference in Amsterdam in January, the boat was in the middle of the ocean. And yesterday, we got updates that it is actually in South America. And they're in a harbor somewhere on, I think it's Granada. Um, and we're still receiving messages. So this is a very nice uh, application, also a use case where we show that the satellite really works. OK, enough minutes. Let me go to what I wanted to show today. There were two more pictures I want to show you. These are the slides that uh, my colleagues, uh, uh, Rimsky Wolps and uh, Martin van der Oe, showed at uh, a workshop at the Things Conference earlier this uh, year. And I will just use a few pictures um, to show you a few things. So remember, the satellite that we use is very close to the Earth. It's only a 500 kilometer altitude. If you look at the geostationary satellites, the ones that you point your television dish to, those are 35,000 kilometers away. And just give you a bit of perspective, if you see the Earth and the distance our satellite is versus those geostationary satellites, that's a, a huge difference, as you can see. So this satellite is really close to the ground. That's also obviously why we can reach it with such low power. So. The satellite travels at 7.6 kilometers per second. That gives you a huge Doppler shift. Uh, that luckily is not a problem for us at all. And it gives you a path loss of 145 dB. But with LoRa, we can easily close the link. OK. This was part of the workshop. Uh, Rimsky presented this, uh, uh, exactly how you determine where the satellite is at any point. Um, the only thing I'm going to say about it here is that we will provide you a library that is going to tell you exactly where the satellite is going to be in the future. So you get a library and you say, when is the next satellite pass in the place where I am? And it will tell you exactly, wake up at this time, and then you can send to the satellite. So we take that all that complexity away from your application. OK, let me show something real at this time. Um, so I have here, let me show you the device. I have here a. Laguna uh, device. This is the device that Joost Kauweiser makes that you will see in the in the movie later on. Um, it's an Arduino compatible board. So we have a boards file for it that you can download from our uh, GitHub. Um, and there's a library. That library is unfortunately not on GitHub yet, but it will be uh, around the summer called Lip Lacuna. Um, that provides you all the functionality you need to make a very simple sketch to send to the satellite. So I will plug it in to my USB so you can see I'm actually doing something real here. I will put it in boot mode and it was just starting up and I put it over here. So I have a very simple Arduino sketch here. Uh, you can actually see uh, my keys, but uh, don't worry, I will delete the devices uh, after the workshop. And the first uh, test will be from this device to TTN. So we have an address here. I already have made the application, of course, and it starts with 26, which is a device address from TTN. 
the device itself has a few sensors, so it has a BME 280 for uh, temperature, humidity, and pressure, and it has an accelerometer, uh, so we can actually see the orientation. So we start the sketch. The board has a GPS on it as well, which I will now uh, simply disable. Um, it prints a few things about uh, the, uh, the region where you are. And this is really all the configuration you need. So you start with an object that holds your uh, configuration for the, uh, the lower chip, the SX1262 in this case. Um, everything in the library is configured default for our own board. But if you want to use another board, and I have an example here. Where did I put it? Um, oh, I had a very nice board from Heltec, but I can't find it right now. But basically, you can run this on any, any LoRaWAN device. You just change the pin numbers here, and it will use uh, any uh, Arduino-compatible LoRaWAN device. In the next section, we define the LoRaWAN parameters, where we actually pass the network key, the app key, and the device address. I'm using uh, ABP in this example, because that's very simple. Um, you could do a join as well, but then you have to join on the terrestrial network and then send to the satellite later on. So here I can set some uh, configuration for the uh, transmission to the to the satellite. So I set the power to 14 dBm. I can set the coding rate here to uh, a half. We have different options there. And I can also set the options for the terrestrial transmit, where I set the spreading factor to 7. That's all that needs to be configured. And then I have a loop which sends every 20 seconds, it generates a message, which means uh, read all the sensors and uh, create uh, the LoRaWAN payload. And then I have a command that says uh, send LoRaWAN and it will send a message over the terrestrial network. But below here, I have the same thing, but now sending to uh, the satellite. So the first one will send a LoRa SF7 message. The second one will send the new data rate, which will be received by the satellite. Obviously, I'm inside my house right now. The satellite is not over my head. But luckily, I have another satellite here in the same room that I put in receive mode. So I'm going to compile this and flash this onto the device. And it will, in a few moments, start sending. flashed, it reboots, there we go. Oh, I have made one small mistake, I see, because all the sensors are not selected. So we have two versions of the board. I have a version 3 board, so I recompile for version 3. I still had it on version 2, because on the balloon we had exactly the same board this morning, uh, this afternoon, and uh, that was uh, using a V2 board. So I recompile, I send it, I download it to the device. And now it's reading the temperature and the orientation. Now we switch to the Things Network console. I will clear it here. And you will see the messages. The even messages are sent to the gateway here. The uneven messages are sent to the satellite. So you will see message one. Uh, so I just cleared so zero was from the gateway. Message one was from the satellite. Here we have two to the gateway. The satellite has a slight delay. Normally, this can, when the satellite is really flying over your head, it will be longer, of course. Now it's just a few seconds. So number three is again from the satellite. If I look at the metadata, I see a gateway UI here, which is basically our virtual gateway, which is the satellite. And if I show the gateway on the lower message, you actually see a real gateway over there. So this works. So the messages sent to the satellite are processed in our backend and then forwarded to TTN base and the configuration. Back to our sketch. And here I had the LoRaWAN addresses. I'm going to comment them out. And now I will change to another address, which is an address that starts with 27, which is from the things industries. So that device is registered on our uh, instance of uh, the, the things industries uh, LoRaWAN server in the cloud. And there we connect to the packet broker. So this is going to be interesting. I will recompile. 
the device will uh, start sending again. But now, the, based on the device address, the traffic should be forwarded to the things industries. So here we have our application in uh, the uh, in the cloud. We wait a moment, and here I don't have a normal gateway connected, so we're only going to see uh, the messages. Uh, the satellite. So here's my message. I click on it and I see my data. So I see the humidity and the pressure and the temperature and everything. And now I see something interesting because here in the metadata, it doesn't show a gateway, it shows the packet broker. So our backend is connected to the packet broker based on the net ID and the device address. Uh, the traffic is forwarded to things industries and uh, there it's forwarded to my private instance. So here I have a complete private network which has satellite connectivity enabled. So this was really simple. Um, it's a really simple LoRa one, uh, sorry, a really simple uh, Arduino library uh, to just get you started. And once we're ready for uh, trials, we will completely open source this so you can either use it or you can adapt it for your own usage. This is very simple. It's not a LoRa one library, as I said before. The real good news is that uh, Matthijs is uh, working together with us on a uh, Arduino version of Basic Mac. And yesterday and today, he worked very hard in uh, uh, getting it ready uh, to show it to a larger audience. It was already public for some time. So on our uh, GitHub, which is github.com slash lacuna space, you see um, a version of Basic Mac that is uh, Arduino compatible. Um, it is work in progress. It is far from done, but it works, and we need your uh, uh, your help in, in testing it and your engagement in improving it. And some people are already doing that. Once we're ready for testing to the satellite, we will simply merge uh, 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 a commit into this that uh, will uh, give you the extra data rate that you need to send to the satellite. So if you have basic Mac working, this version of basic Mac, it will automatically work with the satellite whenever we uh, we push the update. I really like this because then we can make use of a real uh, existing LoRaWAN library that is not dependent on, on Lacuna in any way. As I explained before, there will be a Lacuna library that my colleagues are working on um, that will allow you to predict when the satellite is in view. Um, it will also automatically download the, the Almanac, either via the terrestrial network or via the satellite. And it will uh, automate uh, the, the whole process of scheduling your uplinks uh, to the satellite. So you don't need to worry about that. It will be available on Arduino and, of course, as well for Embed and all kinds of other platforms, as it will not be hardware dependent. Those were the things I wanted to cover today in, uh, in the in the in the workshop or in the, in the, in the demo. Um, obviously, I'm very curious in the meantime, we have launched this balloon in the morning to see how the balloon is doing. So I'm quickly going to show here and check on the TTN mapper page. I see the balloon is moving towards Germany now. The altitude is 21 kilometers. My expectation is it will go up to 35, 36, maybe 37, uh, something around that. and the, Furthest distance we have reached is to a gateway at 600 kilometers. Um, we were, well, I was not really trying to break any record today, but you never know what happens. Uh, it mostly depends on the weather conditions. Let me think if I have covered all the things I wanted to share with you today. Um, do I have anything to show? Um, no, so stay tuned. I know everybody is extremely eager to get started, and I fully understand. And so sometimes on social media, you see a few people who have a device because we work with them, and we need some people to test things for us and, and to help us. Um, it is coming. Uh, Lacuna is working very hard and uh, proceeding uh, as normal. We are dependent on launches, of course. Um, our target is still to make this uh, more widely available for trial in the summer and to have real service by end of the year. And uh, as I said, we were working very hard towards that. So that was to conclude my part for today. Um, then we have uh, the movie from Maria Kalama about building the satellites and uh, uh, a backstage uh, uh, video. 
And then after that, the video from uh, Dario and Joost about uh, our devices. I think this is going to be started automatically. There's nothing I can do, so I assume it will be started. I'm Dario Puma, product manager for Laguna Space. Uh, I'm in the Utrecht office uh, in the Netherlands uh, of uh, Laguna Space, uh, giving you uh, behind the scenes and a sneak preview of the development board we are going to uh, see uh, released this summer when we uh, start our pre-commercial uh, service in the office. Uh, the office is a little bit quiet, but uh, today in the office is Joost Kouwijzer and Joost is the person responsible uh, within Lacuna Space for the reference designs. Uh, yep, we, uh, as you know, uh, Lacuna, we, yeah, we do make hardware, but we don't sell it. We make reference designs and our partners uh, use these reference designs to uh, uh, create their own products, which you can then uh, uh, buy or source through uh, them. So. Uh, Joost, maybe you can explain a little bit about our first uh, product. Probably everybody's familiar with it because yes. of uh, Andreas Spies. Yes. <laughs> you made a review on YouTube about Apple uh, hardware with, uh, with a blue box, in the blue box. Yeah, it was, I think, uh, just before it's the good. end of 2019, I think. Yes, it was in, yeah. yeah. First packet sent, according to him. Oh, nice. Very good. Yes, that's first. Um, we also work with RefThings. RefThings mm -hmm. is an antenna for us. Mm -hmm. um, with this antenna, you can send messages to the satellite. Um, you need this antenna and the SX1262 uh, module uh, to send messages to the satellite. Mm -hmm. So it's nothing, we say it's nothing fancy, the box fancy. standard terrestrial. Only thing different is the antenna, of course. We get a lot of questions uh, why can't we have one yet? Because they are for testing. Mm -hmm. uh, we have In different conditions, I think there's one on Antarctica. Antarctica and on the sailing boat. Yacht. Yeah. Extremes we're testing. Temperature. Yeah. Regions. So okay. Um, but, was, but good news. It's coming something um, new. Rafings uh, made this, uh, made the antenna and made this uh, board. Mm -hmm. Um, they integrated the antenna into the hardware. Mm -hmm. It's based on all uh, reference design. And this one is the one that's going to be available, I think, this in summer, the summer yeah. when we do pre commercial yes. start. Okay. There is a GPS uh, on the mm -hmm. board to locate uh, the location of the device. Mm -hmm. With the location, you can calculate when the satellite uh, satellite's coming over and when mm -hmm. you can send messages to the satellite. Mm -hmm. um, there's an SX1262. Uh, module from e -Bite. and that's a standard Semtech uh, thing you same yes. terrestrial yeah. thing yeah. same power same frequency spectrum yeah. very good some sensors are on the board and there's an crypto uh, chip okay to commission it uh, yes very good this will be uh, if everything is okay we're testing now uh, mm -hmm. hardware uh, it will be available in the summer. Because we are a little bit techy, we like to see the frequency plot, which looks very it looks good. Good, yeah, good, yeah. good, good. It looks good. You can tune the antenna uh, for 868 uh, or 915 uh, megahertz. Okay, but probably we're gonna, uh, when the devices are sold, they're gonna be pre tuned to 868 or. Yes. Okay, very good. Anything to add, maybe? Um, not really. Um, no, we, we hope that uh, that uh, even though there is corona uh, going around, that we will be on schedule with uh, this one. Maybe uh, interesting to say uh, you can send 50 bytes per 50 bytes, 50 bytes per satellite pass, and yes, you can message. do in one message. And you can uh, uh, when we uh, do pre-commercial this summer, you can have. Uh, two messages, uh, one or two messages a day, depending on your latitude, longitude. It is global coverage from the start. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. This was the preview from the, uh, the behind the scenes from the Utrecht office and uh, hope to uh, see you all in good health. Bye bye. Hey everyone, I hope you're well. 
I am Maria and I do business development at Latina Space. Just for this conference, I have put together some video going behind the scenes in the facilities that make and launch our satellites. So let's get straight into it. Now the journey for our satellites starts at Lacuna Space close to Oxford in the United Kingdom. We are part of the Harwell campus, which is home also to the European Space Agency in the UK and other well-known space businesses. Now we develop the LoRa communications module for the satellites ourselves in-house. Together with the spacecraft antenna, it's called the satellite payload. Now our operational payloads will be assembled in a facility we will share with Oxford Space Systems. They also make the helical deployable antennas for us, and maybe you've seen them in pictures of our satellites. Now we sneaked in a couple of weeks ago, and we actually did this with a phone. That's a really nice view of the clean room. Uh, you'll see it's really high because they also make these uh, big unfurlable antennas, and these are used for big telecommunication missions. Now, where do we start when we make a Laguna Space satellite? So first, we receive uh, the communications and power PCBs from Parametric in Switzerland, which is where they're being manufactured. And but as I said, we do the development in-house ourselves. Now, these go in an aluminium enclosure, mainly for RF, but also radiation shielding. We then place the electronics unit into a test jig, and that simulates the satellite interface. And then we just test, test, test. One of the tests that we do is for vibration. So what you see here is the electronics unit together with the antenna stowed, same as what it would be for flight, uh, and that sits on a shaker table. So this will actually vibe for the same kind of frequencies that the payload will go through during the rocket launch. Now you get the idea, and this is an antenna Deploy. deployment test, and we do this in what's called a thermal vacuum chamber. And once we're happy that the payload works well, then we move it to spacecraft integration. One of our satellite manufacturing partners are Nano Avionics, and they develop what's called the satellite bus or the platform. Now, the platform has all the necessary subsystems to power and operate um, a payload in space, uh, things like solar panels or batteries. Now, the platforms that we use are small, and they are called 3U or 6U CubeSats, and every unit is approximately 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. Now what you see here is an engineer who's assembling what's called a propulsion subsystem for a CubeSat. This is used for controlling and changing the satellite altitude in space after launch and during operations, but it can also be used for deorbiting at the end of life. So here an engineer fits a payload control unit into a CubeSat structure, um, as well as an RF communications module, and she's also holding a set of reaction wheels. Um, and we're going to show a little bit more about how these are made uh, in a little bit. Now, this is a very polished video, which you can watch again on YouTube, but we also have some exclusive footage from Nano Avionics, um, and they are actually building a latest satellite just as we speak. So this is FlatSat, a software and hardware emulation unit, which represents the real satellite during development and while it is in orbit. So here we can see most of the satellite subsystems uh, top left is the electrical power subsystem with the batteries on top and then for the rest um, you've got the uh, comms modules, the payload interface unit, the flight control unit uh, and what's probably the payload control unit. Now what's really nice about FlatSat is that we can also test our own payload firmware remotely uh, and while the satellite is in orbit. So what we will do is we will first test on FlatSat and when we're happy, we will upload the software onto the satellite in space. Now here is an electronics lab uh, or an assembly lab in a clean environment. This is what we need to avoid contamination in space. And again, this is another lab. Uh, so this is where material arrives for inspection and sorting out. And what we can also see here is an engineer who is assembling uh, what we will find out in a minute is actually the electronics for one of the reaction wheels. Okay, so the reaction wheels are essentially flywheels which are used to produce a small amount of torque uh, to actually change the attitude or to change the orientation of the spacecraft while it is in space. Okay, so what we need is to keep some fairly uh, precise pointing uh, of the satellite. 
mostly for the RF links. Now what you can see here is that uh, as much progress as we have done with space components, uh, it's still a pretty manual job. Now the reaction wheels are made out of aluminium, but they have this golden color because they're coated with what's called alchrom. This is also a really nice test. It's called a magnetic moment test, uh, probably to characterize the magnetometers. Uh, so here we have the satellite uh, spinning in the same way that it is spinning when it is released out of the launcher. Uh, and the first thing we have to do is stabilize it. And you'll see that in a minute. Okay. Um, and again, once the satellite is all assembled, then we do some more testing of the whole spacecraft. Uh, now in this video, what we see are the engineers. They take the spacecraft out from a test pod, place it on a bench, and then they prepare it for what is called a TVAC, or a thermal vacuum test. Now, if you remember, our satellites will rotate around the Earth every 100 minutes and pass over the poles. Now, this means they will continuously see a difference in temperature between the side of the Earth, which is exposed to the Sun, and the radiation, and then the other side, which we could call the eclipse side. So this means that the temperatures will, will vary between plus or minus 120 to 170 degrees, so what we need to do is test that the subsystems, the electronics, and all the materials will be able to withstand this um, continuous thermal cycling. And apart from this test, the whole spacecraft will also test for vibration. They will test in an RF chamber, and they will also do radiation testing. And when the time comes, we're ready to launch. Now here is some video from our first launch last April on board the PSLV rocket from India. The satellite is actually sent to the launch site about two months before the launch. Small satellites like ours go into what is called a deployer, which, what, which is what you see on the left. And this is bolted onto the fourth stage of the rocket. The PSLV is a four stage to orbit vehicle. And what you see here is that just for this flight, it also had four strap on motors. So every stage will burn, it will be released from the launcher, and then the next one will ignite. So what you see here is just different configurations of the PSLV with a different number of strap-on motors. Now to keep our costs low, we share the launcher with a big satellite mission, and in this case it was Emisat. And there were, there were also another 27 small satellites like ours. Now the fourth and final stage of the rocket will deploy the main mission first, and then it's going to use its liquid propulsion engines. It will fire them twice to travel down from an altitude of 749 kilometers to 504 kilometers, which is where we need to be. And then it's going to release the CubeSats. And we have liftoff. So again, this is from our launch last April. So we lift off normal, separation of the strap on motors at one minute after launch, separation of the first stage again later on. Ignition of the second stage. And separation of the fairing. This is what protects the satellites until they are in vacuum. Separation of the main mission. And release of the CubeSat. pretty impressive, isn't it? So once the satellite is launched, then the operations team will identify which one's the right satellite, and then they will do what's called detumbling. So they're going to stabilize the satellite, acquire pointing, and then they will make contact through the telemetry and telecommand link. And then they're going to use this to turn on every subsystem one by one. What we will do is we will deploy the antenna 
and then we're going to turn on the payload and start testing and do service commissioning. The video is credits uh, official. So we actually have another three satellites uh, coming up soon. They're actually now waiting to be launched. And like everybody at the minute, uh, unfortunately, we're just waiting to see how the current health situation might, might have to affect our planning. So thank you for watching. I hope you have enjoyed the video. Keep well, keep in touch, and back to Thomas. Okay. Um, back online. Um, that was really nice to see that video with all these pictures that once when we were seeing them live, we didn't know exactly how well everything would go to work. And now we're very confident because we have something in space that works fine. Um, I'm going to close off because I see on the chat uh, that the questions are all being answered by my colleagues. Uh, there are no open questions as far as I can see. Um, it was really great seeing so many people uh, on this uh, online event. And uh, for me, the whole day has been uh, has been excellent. Thank you all for joining and uh, stay tuned. Uh, soon you will be able to join us and uh, use our service and play with the satellite. Thank you. <laughs>